before watching this video, please watch the previous two videos in the playlist. We're going to design the following. Design a combinational logic circuit for a microprocessor memory system that consists of four 2K memory chips. Well, the first thing to do to get a handle on this problem is to draw the schematic diagram. And here you can see I'm drawing a central processing unit and four memory chips. Now the memory chips are going to be supplied by an address bus here and we can see that I'm labelling that as an address bus and I'm labelling the memory chips from 0 through to 3 and then we're going to take a tap off the address bus to each of the memory chips as you can see here. Now each of these are going to be 2K, 2 kilobyte locations and that means that we need 2 to the 11 address lines going to each chip because they're all identical. Now the thing is overall we have 8K of memory. Now that means we have to raise 2 to the 13. So the overall address bus needs to be 13 address lines from A0 through to A12. And if we have a look at the schematic diagram for the address lines going into the chips, we can see that they go from A0 to A10. We can see that each chip has a chip select and what we need to do is to build a logic circuit where the output from the logic circuit goes to each of the chip selects. And the purpose of this is to ensure that at any one time we can only have one chip switched on and all of the other chips switched off. So we're going to design this logic circuit. To the input of the logic circuit I'm going to take a tap of the address bus. I'm going to take A. 11 and A12 and this particular line here is going to be the select signal which we can think of as being a zero and the output I'm going to label as F1 through to F4. Now the reason why we've tapped off two address lines A11 and A12 is that on these two lines it's possible to have four possible conditions 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 and 1, 1. Those four marry up to the fact that we have four chips. So we're going to arrange that 0, 0 selects chip 0. And then of course 1, 1 will select chip 3. And the two different combinations in between will be responsible for selecting chip 1 and chip 2. Now I'll just label the inputs to this logic circuit as A, B and C. Let's draw the logic circuit in isolation. Here we can see it. I'm drawing it here, and that's going to be the combinational logic circuit. It has three inputs, A, B, and C, and it's going to have four outputs all the way from F1 all the way through to F4. Now, if we look at F1, that's going to go to chip 0's chip select. F2 goes to the chip select of chip 1. All the way through to the last one, F4, which is going to be connected to the chip select of chip 3. Now input A is actually connected to the central processing unit and the control unit will send out a low pulse. This is the low pulse here which we can think of as being zero. Now nothing gets selected until that pulse is low. Now inputs B and C are connected to A11 and A12 respectively as I'm showing here. But in combination, the pulse and these two address lines are responsible for selecting a memory chip. And depending on the combinations on A11 and A12 dictates which chip is selected. But to stress, nothing gets selected unless input A to the logic circuit has a low pulse. And that low pulse comes from the control unit of the central processing unit. In other words, a zero on A11 and A12, if the control unit sends a low pulse, should be used to select chip zero, i.e. if they're all zero. Let's consider all of the possibilities using a truth table. The truth table for this logic circuit will have inputs A, B and C, and of course the outputs will be F1, F2, F3 and F4. And I'll just quickly draw out all of the possible input combinations as you can see here. To select a chip requires one of the outputs to be a zero for a combination 
and all of the others to be a 1 for the same combination. For the first row in the truth table I'm going to make F1 a 0 and F2, F3 and F4 I'm going to make a 1 which means that when A, B and C are 0 F1 will be a 0 and all other outputs will be a 1. Now this will mean that chip 0 will be switched on i.e. selected and all the other chips will be switched off i.e. not selected. Of course this is the only time we want F1 to be a 0 so all other occasions we need F1 to be a 1. For the second row I'm going to arrange that F2 is a 0 and that's all the other outputs are in fact 1. So for the rest of F2 I want that to be a 1 as you can see here. So the second combination is responsible for making F2 a 0 and that is what will switch on chip 1. The third row we're going to arrange that F3 is a 0 and then for the rest of F3 we're going to make it a 1 because we only want one input combination to make F3 a 0. Now this will mean that on this combination chip 2 will be selected and all of the chips will not be selected. We now need a combination where F4 is a 0 as you can see here and the rest of F4 I'm going to make a 1. Now if we look at the fourth row what we can see we now have a situation where we can have F4 being a 0 and all of the other outputs being a 1. So this combination of inputs is responsible for selecting chip 3. Consider this about the truth table. When A was a 1 it means that there was no low pulse present. Now when this is the case what we're really saying is nothing can be selected. We have none of the chips selected and I've shown that here in the truth table because you can see every output from F1 through to F4 for all of those combinations when A is a 1 they're all 1 indicating that nothing but nothing is being selected. Now when A was a 0 it meant we have a low pulse now that allows for selection. Now the key here is, is to realize it now depends on the value of B and C. So we can see all of the combinations here of B and C that select the chip by making the output 0. I've moved the truth table to here to allow us to derive the sum of min terms for F1. And that's a question of seeing where there's a 1 in the column for F1, looking at the inputs and producing the appropriate min term at each point. Now you need to look back at previous videos in the playlist to remind yourself how to do this if this is baffling you at the moment. And what we end up with is we have F1 being the sum of all of these min terms, which means we take each min term in turn and we all them together as you can see I'm doing here. Let's minimize this expression. So I write that one out again but I can see I've got those two in common so I take those outside the brackets leaving not C or C inside. These two are in common so I bring those outside the brackets leaving not C or C in the brackets. These two are in common so I bring those outside the brackets, leaving not C or C in brackets. Now not C or C is 1, so I can go through replacing that with a 1. So there's the 1 there, if I go to the next term here, that becomes a 1, and finally it's A and B, anded with the 1. Now it's the case that if you and anything with the 1, you can get rid of it, the 1 that is. So I can see that I can write the terms out as shown here. Now what I can do, I can see that not A is common to these two, so I bring that outside the brackets, leaving those inside. Here I can see the A's in common, so I have not B or B in brackets. Now I write this out, but the B knocks the not B out, leaving C or B in the brackets. Now that's odd with this, which becomes a 1 there, as you can see. Expand this bracket, and I get this odd with A. Now A will knock those two out leaving C or B or A which we can write out as A or B or C which we'll write down here as A, B or C as being the minimization for that long Boolean expression. Now a number of those steps made assumptions about your knowledge 
which has been introduced in previous videos in this playlist. So if you were unsure of any of those steps when we were minimizing, please go and look back at some of the Boolean identities and the axioms and the theorems that allowed me to actually do that minimization. What we're now going to do is derive the sum of min terms for F2, which means looking at all of the outputs when F2 is a 1, as you can see here. So doing this for each individual step is a little bit laborious, but nevertheless, just stick with it. And we can see we have all of the min terms now. And now what we do, we write out F2 here by ordering all those min terms together. To minimize this particular expression, we're going to do it differently. We're going to draw a three variable Carnot map, which I'm just sketching out here. And now I'm labeling appropriately. There's not B, there's B, and we can see we've got the C and the not C there. Now looking at each of these in turn, we plot them on the map, as you can see here. So I'm underlining them and then finding their particular position on the map. Now you need to look back at previous videos to remind yourself of this. Once we've plotted it, we now loop. Now that particular loop, if we look carefully, we can see is exclusively in B. And this loop here is actually exclusively in A. And this loop now, which is possibly a little bit more difficult to identify, because you have to remember those edges are connected, that is in not C. So therefore F2 is A or B or not C which we can actually write out down here as A or B or not C. And I'm just going to put the other one back in there because I must have deleted that earlier by mistake. Let's consider the output for F3, which is this column. There's lots of ones there. There's only one zero. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to plot that zero. But I'm going to plot it using an X. So there is the X, which means a one doesn't go there. Now I'm going to put the seven ones everywhere else. And now I'm going to get rid of that X because it's not part of the plot. Then I loop the ones and I got not B. I loop the ones here and I can see that that is C. And then finally I can see that those four ones actually give me A. So F3 is A or not B or C, which I will write out here and here so we can see them all lined up underneath each other we will now do something similar for the output f4 we locate the zero which we can see is that min term stick an x in there realize this seven one stick a one everywhere else get rid of the x loop there to give us a loop here and we can see when we've completed that loop that it all actually belongs to not c then loop this one and we can see that is not b so that's our final expression for F4, and I'll line them up all here so we can see it's A or not B or not C. I've moved the minimized expressions to the top left corner, and now I can build the combinational logic circuit. So I need an OR gate for A or B or C, which is F1 output. I take a tap off the A in here. I take a tap off the B. I take a tap off the C. Put that through a NOT gate to get NOT C. And now I can see I've got the output for F2. Going on to the blue gate, I take a tap, as you can see here, but that goes through a NOT gate to give me NOT B. And then I take the C in, give me the output for F3. And now I have another OR gate. I take a tap off the A, take a tap off the NOT B and the NOT C. To see here, I have A or NOT B or NOT C being the output for F4. So we can see that this logic circuit that I've just designed goes here as shown on the schematic diagram for the microprocessor system.